13. And as I was saying, we're just going to look at some really basic stuff this morning that will uh, probably, in most cases, just reinforce things we already know. I know myself, I have to go back to look at these basic things in my study time, my uh, time with the Lord, because if I don't, it's really easy to get off track from the basic things. It's very easy to get off track with the basic truths of God's Word. Um, we're in a world that everything in this world is contrary to God's Word. So we're constantly experiencing things that tell us the opposite of God's Word. We're constantly being exposed to things that are the opposite of God's Word. So quite often when we go back to these things, even though they're very simple, even though they're very basic, even there's something that most people say, well, I know that, Pastor, I know that, I know that. We also need to be reminded for the sake of focus. So maybe it's something new to you as we look and study a little bit about living by faith, but maybe it's just something we're just going to refocus a little bit this morning. But Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 says, Who hath delivered us, this is talking about Jesus has delivered us, from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Translated us from the power of darkness or the rule of darkness, into the kingdom of his son. And uh, I often use the example, you've probably heard me mention it many times, where, where Jesus cast a demon out of the individual and, and they accused him of doing it by the power of Beelzebub, as they said, or by the power of darkness. And, you know, Jesus went on to explain, no, even Satan's smarter than that. You know, if, if he knows that a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. So if Satan is, you know, is fighting against himself, then obviously his kingdom wouldn't stand. But then he went on to say, but if I cast out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, Jesus very plainly there reveals two kingdoms. Kingdom of darkness, kingdom of God. Kingdom of darkness, kingdom of God. And we understand by the scripture I just read you that when we come to Christ, when we're born again, actually we're translated from one kingdom to another. We're translated from the rule of one kingdom to the rule of another. And so... When we do that, when we're born again and we're translated from one kingdom to another, then there's something that quite often I think gets overlooked there. And, you know, I've shared it here lately and quite a few times about that. You know, in this world system, in this world's kingdom, people will put forth great effort to learn how to live in this world. I mean, they'll go to school for, you know, 16, 17, 18 years sometimes, in different cases, sometimes longer than that, to learn how to do something and to function in some capacity in this world. How to be, you know, they'll go to high school and then they'll graduate, and they'll go to college and sometimes into graduate school, and there are people who invest a lot of years to learn how to do something in this world. But then again, when somebody comes to Christ and they're born again, for some reason they think they automatically know how to live in God's kingdom. They think they automatically know how to do things in God's world and in God's ways. But when we're born again, we're translated from one kingdom to another kingdom. So we need to learn how to live God's way. We need to learn how to live in God's kingdom. The same way as if I was to pick you up today and, you know, could just some kind of way just drop you right in the middle of China. You know, some place where the society and the culture is completely different. You would have a hard time functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you'd have a hard time communicating with people. You'd have a hard time knowing, you know, uh, what the laws are. In China, it's really good to know the laws because it's bad to break the laws in China uh, because there's not a lot of compassion in the court system there. Uh, so there's a lot of things that would be very important to learn that we wouldn't know if we were dropped right in the middle of that culture. And so it, it's kind of, in a sense, the same thing. We're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. Now, we understand from God's word that God desires for each and every one of us to walk in victory. Let me read you two scriptures real quick. Go to 3 John 2. And these, again, all this is pretty basic stuff. Most of you have heard this. Um, but we're going to just refocus. 3 John 2. Scripture that many of us can quote. says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. So it tells us there that God wishes above all things that we would prosper, that we would be in health, even our soul prospers. So God has good plans for us. God has a desire for us to walk in victory. God's will for our life is that we walk in victory. Now let me read you another scripture real quick, Psalm 34, 19. You hear me quote this one all the time. Psalm 34, 19. Let's read it together this morning. It says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered us from them all. Let me read that to you. You hear me say? 
say that all the time. Many, I'm reading it now, are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. So God realizes that there are many afflictions in this world. God realizes there are many battles in this world. God realizes there are many struggles in this world. There are many attacks of the enemy in this world. But God has a desire and a plan, and God's will is that we be delivered from every one of them. So you might say, well, wait a second, Pastor. You says it's God's will above all things that I prosper and be in health, then why am I not prospering and in health? You may say, well, wait a second, Pastor. It says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. Why have I not been delivered from all of my afflictions? There's some I haven't been delivered from. Well, that's a good question, isn't it? And a lot of times people then turn right around and they blame God. They say, well, I guess that ain't true. God really don't want me delivered. I guess that ain't true. God really don't want to bless my life. I guess that ain't true. God really don't want to prosper me. Well, maybe it gets back to what we're talking about. Maybe we've been translated from one kingdom to the other and we don't really grasp and understand how to do things in God's kingdom so that we do prosper or how to do things in God's kingdom so we are delivered from the afflictions. Maybe we're in China and we're really confused about how to believe and function on a day-by-day -day basis. You see, that's very important to understand. God has a will for us to walk in victory, but he also has a way we have to do that. And we have to learn how to do that. And that's one of the most important things. That's why we're doing, why we go to church. That's why we do what we do. God sent the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry and to teach them how to live. So you're here today and we're all in school on how to function and operate in God's way of doing things, in God's kingdom. And it's very important that we understand these things and we keep focus on this so we realize what we're doing. If we don't realize what we're doing here, then we're never going to achieve the goal, are we? If we don't realize why we go to church, then we're never going to obtain what we're looking to do in church. And, you know, the parable of the sower, and you hear me talk about that one in Mark chapter 4, and that's where Jesus talked about the sword goes forth and sows the word, and then there's many things that attack the word, isn't there? persecutions and afflictions and cares of this world and lust of other things and the deceitfulness of riches are the things that it says that the enemy uses to attack the word of God. And so we understand there, it goes on to say though that there are some, there are some that originally, immediately receive the word with joy and then something happens, they don't see the fruit come forth right away and so they fall away. So one of the number one reasons that most Christians, if you want to call it that way, really stumble in their walk or fall away from church is they're not seeing the manifestation of what they hear from behind the pulpit. They hear, well, the pastor stands up and says, Beloved, I wish above all things that now prosper and be in hell. And they say, well, I'm not prospering, I'm not in hell. Because they have many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from the altar. They say, well, that's not happening in my life. So there apparently is something wrong with this. Well, maybe we're just not understanding how to do it. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that's the case. So many people come to church, they hear some things taught behind the pulpit, and then they don't see it come to pass in their life right away, so they fall away. And they say, well, I need another church. Well, I need to do this, or I need to do that, or, or maybe there's not anything to that. There's something wrong here. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe there's something wrong with that preacher. Maybe there's something wrong with the worship team. You know, maybe there's something wrong with the Sunday school teachers. What have you? Maybe it's the building. I mean, we start looking for reasons why this is not happening in our life rather than realizing, hey, I need to learn how to walk in victory God's way. It does not happen automatically. You can be saved and born again and not walk in victory. Amen. You can be saved and born again and not know God's word and not walk in victory. Right. You can be saved and born again and know God's word, but not put it to practice and not walk in victory. Or you can be saved, born again, know God's word, how to do God's word, walk out God's word, and see victory. There are no other options in that area. So it's important that we learn God's word, we learn how to apply God's word to our life to see the victory that God has promised. And that doesn't mean it's easy because and the scripture teaches us the exact opposite all the way. It teaches us that the enemy does fight against it. That's exactly what the parable of the sword is about. As soon as the word of God is sown in our heart, the enemy comes immediately and tries to 
can destroy that work. So it is a valid. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's go to Luke chapter 7. And, and just look at a couple things here. And just, I, you know, I've, I have taught about this example here on numerous times. And there's a couple things that I was reading, reading over it yesterday. It just really jumped out at me. A couple of real key things that I think, you know, really hinder people. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Now in the scripture, let me go ahead and read this to you. Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy, but thou shouldst enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Then the man says, For I also a man said under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sent. Now, you've heard me talk about this several different times and use this in several different illustrations and examples. But there's two things in that passage there that will tell you two things that greatly hinder people from receiving things from God. There are two major things there. One is, the Jewish people went to Jesus, and they besought Jesus that Jesus would come to this man's house for the reason that this man had built a synagogue. So in the Jewish mindset, and it was very common at that point in time, they thought that you received from God by your good works. And they thought because this man has done this good deed, because this man has built a synagogue, that because of that, that Jesus is going to come and heal this individual. We never receive anything from God because we've earned it. That man did not earn his servant's healing. He couldn't have done enough good deeds, but in the Jewish mindset at that time, that's what they were expecting. Well, of course Jesus will come heal this man's servant. Look at what he's done. He has built this beautiful synagogue. Jesus is not going to respond to that. You see, the idea of works on both sides here has, has greatly hindered this miracle from taking place. First of all, if it would have been up to the Jewish people, it would have never happened. Secondly, there's something else in this man's life that is very evident here. He apparently has faith. Because Jesus tells him he has great faith. But there's a reason that it hadn't happened up until that point. Because that man made the statement himself that, let me read it to you. Go to verse number 7. And notice what this man had said to himself. The Jews had went to Jesus asking that he would come to this man's house and heal this servant because of his great works. This man said, then wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. But say the word, and my servant shall be healed. So the reason his servant hadn't been healed up to this point was that man didn't think he was worthy enough to even call Jesus to come to him. So we see works on both sides. The Jews thought this man has done such great works. He built a synagogue. Jesus is surely going to heal his servant. This man is looking at it too from a worse mentality. And he's thinking, my goodness, how can I, on the basis of who I am and what I've done, expect Jesus to come bring healing? He thought, I'm not even worthy. And I thought, boy, you know, that just jumped out at me in this last couple of days as I've been studying for this teaching. How many people are hindered from going to God to receive their miracle because they think they're not worthy to even approach it? How many 
many people out there thinking, well, you know what? I'm in this situation and I know God could help me, but God would never do that for me. God would never heal me. God would never set me free. God would never bless me. How many people hear these scriptures and it's God's will to, to prosper them and be in health and think, well, yeah, but not me. How many people hear these scriptures that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers from y'all, think, well, yeah, but not me. How many people think, well, I'm not even worthy to go to God in prayer. I'm not even worthy to take this need to the Lord. And maybe you don't feel that way, maybe you don't think that way, but I'll tell you, beloved, there's a lot of people that do. And I think probably if we were all real honest, we'd probably all fought that battle somewhere along the line in life. And maybe we didn't put it into those words, but there have been times that we didn't feel, for whatever reasons, that we could go to God and ask Him to do something on the basis that we were looking at ourselves, rather than the words of Christ. You see, we approach God not because we built a synagogue, we don't stay away from God because we're not worthy. We approach God on the basis of the works of Jesus Christ. On the basis of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, that's the one thing that we learn all throughout the scriptures. I mean, look at the examples we have. Apostle Paul, he went into the high priest to get letters so he could go out and persecute Christians and take them captive. And while he's doing that, Jesus appears to him on Damascus Road and speaks to him. Now what did Paul do to deserve Jesus to appear to him like that? What good works did he do? He was persecuting the church. Obviously he didn't do anything to deserve it. The reason that took place, I'm sure, is because the body of Christ was doing what Jesus had instructed to do, praying for their enemies. And they were praying for Paul and they, God was answering their prayers and Jesus appeared to Paul and he had a salvation experience right there. It had nothing to do with his works or his deeds. He was probably the most evil man on the planet at that time. I mean, probably without a doubt. He even referred to himself as the chief of sinners. So it obviously wasn't his words. What did, you know, we, we always talk about the gentleman in, in, uh, in the Gospels that was delivered, was full of a legion of demons. What did he do to deserve deliverance? I bet he done a lot of good deeds when he was demon-possessed. I bet he done a lot of good works. Obviously, obviously, he did absolutely nothing to deserve being delivered that day. Other than he fell at the feet of Jesus and worshipped him. See, we can go on down the line. We can look at Exodus chapter 12 where they put the blood above the door. There was no works done, no deeds done. It was simply, what is the blood there? Is the blood there? Is the blood there? So, beloved, I bring out these points to kind of bring an illustration to you that if you're on either side of the coin there, if you think you're going to receive something from God because you've done good works, you're missing God. On the other side of the coin, if you think you can't approach God because you're not worthy, you're missing God. Beloved, you can approach God and you can receive anything God promises on the basis of the works of Jesus Christ. It's not what I've done, it's not what you've done. It's not my worthiness, it's not your worthiness, it's the worthiness of Jesus Christ. That is key there. But it's really easy to fall prey to either one of those sides of the, of the coin. There's a lot of people out there, beloved, who, who base their what they, what they their base their walk with God on the basis of their works and their deeds. And there's a lot of people out there who won't approach God because they think, well, God, I'm not worthy for that. But we know that our salvation and, 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 and everything we receive, God, does not come by our righteousness, it comes by his righteousness. Amen? Yeah. You with me so far? Okay. Let's go to an angel of scripture we know, Romans chapter 10. And like I said, we're just doing some basic teaching on how to live in God's kingdom. And one of the first things we have to understand is, is the just shall live by faith. We walk by faith then, not by sight. The world kingdom walks by sight, doesn't it? The world's kingdom walks by what they, what they see and hear and feel and taste and touch. The Bible says we walk by faith. The just shall live by faith. All the blessings of God we receive by faith. We inherit by faith. Amen? Y'all are looking at me kind of funny, though. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. We could probably all quote this, couldn't we? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, I want to just stop and think about that for just a second. Now, in this world... God's laws always work, don't they? I mean, do God's laws fail in this world? 
They don't do this. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. Has gravity ever failed? Has there ever been a time in the history of man when we had a really bad day and say, we're going to keep, turn on the TV and say, we don't know what's going on, but gravity is not working today. Stay in your house. <laughs> That's never occurred, has it? I mean, I've never, I mean, I, I've been a lot of different places. And I've never been any place where they said, you know what, you need to really be careful here. Gravity is weak here. That doesn't happen, does it? In other words, gravity always works everywhere on this planet, doesn't it? As far as I know, I've never been anywhere where gravity didn't work. It would be an interesting place if it didn't. I mean, can you imagine going somewhere to cool? But gravity always works. God's laws and principles always work. Gravity always works, doesn't it? Always. Every time. There's never been a fail to it, has it? Some of you are looking like you're trying to think of time when gravity didn't work. That one day, remember 1932, December 7th, everybody had to strap themselves down because gravity was weak that day. It always works. And it's humorous to us. It seems ridiculous to us. That would be an interesting TV show, wouldn't it? The day gravity quit. <laughs>
This word overrides gravity. It does. One day we're all going to be raptured out of here. It's going to override gravity, I guess, isn't it? Gravity is going to say, Mike, stay on earth. God's going to say, Mike, come on. And when God says, Mike, come on, gravity no longer matters. You see, there was two blind men. And they were standing by the roadside, and Jesus was walking by. Son of David! Son of David! Have mercy! Have mercy! Son of David! Have mercy! Have mercy! And Jesus stopped and sent somebody and says, go tell them to come here. Now, the laws of this world say that blind men don't see. Isn't that true? I mean, somebody comes to you and says, I'm blind. Don't you assume they don't see? That's a safe assumption, isn't it? The laws of God's kingdom says, if blind men believe, then they see. Right? And Jesus asked him, what do you have me to do? <laughs> We'd like to be able to see Jesus. And when he said, according to your faith, be it done unto you, and they can see. Their faith says, I can see. This world's laws says you can't see. God's kingdom laws overrode the natural laws of this world. Jesus did that on a regular basis, didn't he? He walked on water. Now, doesn't this world's law say that you sink when you walk on water? I mean, if you, if you don't believe me, this is one part of the sermon you can't put to the test. Uh, river's right down here. Have your church. If you want to go prudent and rob, we'll all go watch you walk across the river. It's what this kingdom of the world says, doesn't it? That you can't walk on water. But yet Jesus did walk on water. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, think about this situation. I face this all the time. We all face this on a regular basis. Somebody calls the pastor. Pastor, we can come pray for him. What's wrong? I'm in the hospital. Deathly ill. Okay. You're deathly ill. Now, walk into the room. Well, what's going on? Well, this is what the doctor said. And the doctor says that, you know, I've got this problem and this problem and this problem. And here's, what's the prognosis? The prognosis is what is the expectation of this disease or this affliction? Well, it ain't good. The doctor says that everybody who's ever had this never lived more than three months. Okay. That's this world's evidence, right? That doctor has taken all the years of scientific study, and all those years of scientific study have indicated that people who have this disease, normally these are the symptoms that they have, this is the progress they take, and usually they don't last more than about three months. And you know, there's been 500,000 cases of this, and 498,000 of them have, have died within the first three months. And then this particular doctor says, you know, I've had a lot of experience with this, and quite honestly, you know, everybody I've ever treated is so all of his information and all the evidence he has from this world say that you're going to die. Now, don't get offended, but I'm looking at other evidence. The evidence that I'm there bringing with me says that by the stripes of Jesus, you're healed. The evidence I have is God's word that says that God's a healer of all of us. The one that I have that tells me there that the prayer of faith shall raise up the sick. Now, I'm going by the kingdom of God's evidence, and that doctor's doing his job, he's doing a fine job, he's going by the scientific evidence that he has gathered in this world. Now, the kingdom of God's evidence says that you're going to live and not die. The kingdom of this world's evidence says you ain't got to live about three months to live. Now, if we're operating in the kingdom of God properly, you're going to live and not die. Amen. The kingdom of God is going to override this world's evidence. Jesus did it all the time. The apostles did it all the time. Christians have done that on a regular basis throughout history. Faith coming by. Hearing. Hearing. And hearing by the word of God. How often? All the time. Okay. Um, Romans chapter 14. 
Oh, no, wait, let's go back to Romans 10, 17. I know, I'm getting ahead of myself. Slow down, why? Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing. And hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Let me give you an illustration of that. That's like the nail. Somebody said, well, that's a weird illustration. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God is like the nail. It's like the nail. There's somebody who sends it, there's somebody who delivers it, and there's somebody who receives it. Correct? Correct. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There's somebody who sends it to you. Somebody sends you faith. Faith is in the mail. Faith is in the mail. God has sent faith your way. Right? This is the mailman. Faith cometh by hearing the word of God. How does your mail come? By the mailman. He brings it to you, don't he? So God sent faith. The mailman delivers it. And now you have to receive it. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God said, okay, let's look down here. I'm going to send him some faith. Here it is. Here comes the mailman. Now, we choose whether or not we receive it. We, we don't have to receive our mail. I got a stack of letters on my porch that I haven't received. Put down Because it's not our mail. And post office, for some reason, won't keep one to bring it. No matter how many times we tell them, so I'm tired of messing with it. Like, make a pile of there and we'll do something with it someday. But we still have to receive our mail. We have to open it up. We have to read it. And we have to receive it. And it's the same with this. God has sent us faith. We have to receive it from the mailman. We have to get the word of God into our heart. And then faith comes. Amen? If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, you will ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. If you abide in me, and my word sits on the shelf, if you abide in me and your pastor knows the word, if you abide in me and my word abides in you. Now that's a kingdom law. Yes. The same way as that means. Yes. If we abide in Jesus, his word abides in us. And it's alive on the inside of us. Then we will ask what we will and it shall be done. You with me so far? Yes. Let's go to Acts chapter 14. Man, I'm not going to keep it too long. I'm going to finish this tonight because there's several things I want to all along the same line. Real basic things here. Acts chapter 14. Let me read that to you. Verses 7 through 10. It, it just, we see this very simple process. Acts chapter 14, verses 7 through 10. And there they preach the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly <coughs> holding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped him walk. Now let's break this down for just a second. Something happened there, and there they preached the gospel. What's taking place? Faith coming by hearing, by hearing and, and hearing by the word, the word of God. So the word of God is going forth, right? He's hearing the word. The word of God's going forth. And he's hearing the word. The word of God's going forth. And he's hearing the word. Now you understand, go to Isaiah 55. And I'll bounce you around this morning. Let's tie some scriptures here. Isaiah 55, verse number 11, I believe. Yeah. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So God's saying his word. We have it right here that came out of his mouth, will not return unto him void. And there they're preaching the gospel, right? Now, did you ever stop and ask yourself, and I know I've probably asked you this question before, but sometimes these things are so basic and silly. Why did God give us promises? Did you ever wonder that? Why did God 
in his promises where he promised healing. What was the purpose of God behind that? So we would get healed. Why else would you give somebody a promise? Why did God give us promises that he would bless our lives? So we would get blessed, right? I mean, it would be silly for God to give us a promise of healing if he didn't want to heal us. That would be ridiculous on God's part. It would be ridiculous on God's part that he wanted to bless you financially to promise you that if he's not wanting to do that. So he says here that his word will accomplish his purpose. So I have to assume if he gives a healing promise, the purpose of the healing promise is so it would be healed. Not just to irritate us. Not just to tease us. I know we humans like to do stuff like that. But God doesn't do that. Anyway, all this is holding out in front of them. They don't think they can have it. No, God has a plan and a purpose. So they heard the gospel preached, right? The word of God was going forth. The word of God, God says, is going to accomplish his purpose. So as Paul is preaching here, the word of God is going forth. God is behind that word, seeking to accomplish his purpose that day. In that man's life, that word had a purpose. That word had a plan. That word had a design as it's going forth. That's why it's so important that we hear the word. Amen? Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, notice there also there's something fun. Verse 9. Let's go back there for just a second. Acts chapter 14. Saint heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and proceeding that he had faith to be healed. Stop. Does it say right there he had faith to be healed? It does, doesn't it? It stopped at that point. It says he had faith to be healed. Was he at that point healed? I think she had it when she got out of bed. I think she had it when she walked to Jesus. 
I think when she fought through that crowd and those thronging people all the way saying, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. If I can touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. If I can touch the hem of his garment, I'll be whole. All that time, she had faith to be here. Why else would she get out of bed? Why else would she walk all that way? Why else would she fight through that crowd? But there was something that had to be done to bring manifestation. You can have faith that God will bless you financially, but there's something that has to be done to bring manifestation. You can have faith today to be healed, but there's something that has to be done to bring manifestation. You can sit there today full of faith to be healed and walk out of here and not be healed. See the man with the withered hand? Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. Whew. If he wouldn't have taken that step of faith, his hand would have never been healed. The lady with the issue of blood has for some reason, somehow or another, received revelation from God. It's what was saying, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. If I can just touch the hem of his garment. In other words, there was a step of faith that had to take place for healing. This man who's hearing the gospel preached to him. It says that Paul perceives that he had faith to be healed, but he sits there late. There was a step he had to take before there was manifestation. Stand up! Now that seems simple, doesn't it? That's like me telling you to fly. Go ahead and fly. Just clap your arms and fly. <laughs> Eli, get down from there. <laughs> Think about it. Why is that hard? He's never walked. And you just tell him to stand. How many times do I need to get down all the time to get with crippled people? Why is that hard to walk? Well, most people respond, can't you see I'm crippled? You know, Stevie Wonder, what color is this? Can't you see I'm blind? With the faith that was in there. The faith was there. But there was a step that he had to take to see manifestation come in mass. And there's a lot of people that probably said and have faith. But I'm willing to take the step. Beloved, I wish to do all things that have prospered me and helped me, even as I so prospers. But many are the afflictions of the righteous, but he delivers us from them all. And maybe some have no idea, had no faith whatsoever to be delivered from their affliction, but some have faith to be delivered from their affliction and are sitting there on their hands, not taking the step of faith necessary to take in not getting seen the manifestation. Walls of Jericho. Then march around in six days, not saying it. On the seventh day, march around in seven times, shout, and the walls came down. There was a step of faith they had to take. See, sometimes in the kingdom of God, we have to know what the step of faith is to take, to see the manifestation. Sometimes it's clear cut. Sometimes it's clear cut. You know, call for the elders of the church, have them pray, anoint them with the oil, pray for the sick to be healed. Well, that's one. Lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. That's one. The Bible talks about tithing, doesn't it? If we pay our tithes, what does he say will happen? Go up the windows of heaven, pour out blessings we can't contain. In other words, in the kingdom of God, we can have the faith, but there's still a step of manifestation that needs to be taken. And sometimes in a situation, beloved, one of the things I'm 100% convinced where we miss God at so often is we can know what the Word says, know what the Word promises, and accept the people. Say, well, I know what the Word says, I know what the Word promises, but I'm not seeing that happen in my life for some reason. And what we really need to be doing is we need to be pursuing God and finding out Him what's the step I need to take to see that manifestation. 
what's hindering that manifestation, Lord. I know what you promised. I know that it's true. I know that it belongs to me. But what do I need to take? What step do I need to take at this point, Lord, to see that manifest in my life? And that is some area that I'm 100% convinced is of the utmost importance for the life of a believer. And you find that all the way through the scriptures that they did that. But in our time, for some reason, we have accepted the thief. Well, I don't know, I'm just not God's will to do that. And it says it in its word, it's God's will. It's that simple. But we've got to stop being spiritually lazy, beloved. And not and stop accepting the feet and realize, you know what? I need to find out what my what my step of faith is. I need to find out what condition I need to take to see manifestation come into place. Because I'll guarantee you it's God's will for victory to be manifest in your life. Amen? We'll take this up some more tonight. Go too much farther because there's a lot more. Can I come to your house? Find out. Find out the mail? Yes, sir. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, the mail. Yeah.